All right, let's stand to our feet this morning, church. And this morning, we are going to choose to praise. Sometimes when we don't feel like it or we have sadness in our hearts, we choose to exalt our King, to focus on how powerful He is, on how full of love and mercy He is, and things get better along the way. So join me in singing this morning. Hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My way I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me.
Good morning, Calvary Chapel family. How are we doing this morning? Listen to that fellowship that's going on. Listen, I don't want to stop you, but they give me only so much time and to give you the correct and information you need to get going. So listen, a reminder, we have an upcoming network medical fundraiser April 26. We have these flyers outside in the foyer April 22nd. Thank you. See, your fellowship continues, and I love it. Yes, at the Granada, please. Uh, also, we have Lost and Found out in front. We have glasses, tumblers, clothes, and believe it or not, Bibles. All right. If you're missing your Bible, you don't need to get up right now and get them. But please check. They have it, your name in it. All right. God knows. All right. Hey, mission highlight. Uh, Roatan rummage sale is happening April 27th from 8 to 2. And this is uh, to support our youth, a missions trip to Roatan, Honduras. And uh, this will uh, take place in uh, the 27th, we said, from 8 to 2. Note, though, the location is going to be at Coastline Christian Academy, which is Fairview and Cathedral Oaks, Galita. So it won't be here, it'll be there. You can drop off your uh, best donations, all right, things we can use. Uh, uh, on the 26th, uh, Friday, the 27th, at 3 to 8 p.m., they say, uh, it is a fundraiser. And if you cannot help by donating your best things, we will gladly accept any donation of monetary value so you can support the youth. Yeah? Come on. Yeah, give to them. Yeah, you just make sure you put in the memo. It's for Roatan. Yes, that's going to be great. And now we have a video for you this morning because we want you to see something special. We're going to pray for you. Father, we thank you so much yeah. for Emery. We thank you that she's made this decision. She decided, Lord, and it's, it's time. Yeah. And so, God, I pray that right now... It was fun when they were praying over me. And then just like a few seconds later, I was in the water. And then... And then I came up, and then I felt really, really happy. As her mom, I just want her to know and love Jesus and to ha just have him in her heart and take him wherever she goes. My son is getting baptized today, so I'm here to support him and to celebrate with him. It feels amazing, you know, just accepting Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior and making that a public, a public thing for people to witness. It's, uh, it's, it's been a long time coming for it, but it's something I'm, I'm really proud of doing. Get in here. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I think what I was feeling was so much excitement, I'm not sure if my body could contain it. I was just buzzing with excitement. And no nervousness at all. It's a tremendous experience to see other people baptized. We, we rejoice with them. It's just, if you believe in God and that Jesus is your Savior, please come on in and be a part of this great family. I'm accepting Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior into my life, into my heart. That's my prayer for her, that the gifts he's given her, she'll take and she'll use them. You are all I need Your spirit moves in space Your word is a lamp unto my feet Lord, light the way for me Wonderful, wonderful time of sealing faith. Isn't it gorgeous to see people put their faith in the Lord? Here it is next Sunday, April 21st. This is where you get to identify yourself, those who receive Christ, and then understand the death, the burial, and the resurrection through baptism, where you're raised again and are a new creation. Amen? Listen, we'd love to have you there. It's a special time. We'd love the, the family of God to be there with us at the beach. We're going to walk from here straight down to East Beach, and then we're going to have 
that baptism. It'll be at 1245 immediately after our services here. Women, conference, Saturday, April 27th. Woo, yeah, come on, get excited. It'll be a travel down to Oxnard. Listen, uh, this is for uh, women ages 16 and up. Encourage each of our young ladies here to attend as well. And just hear what women, they're gonna speak to you, our own Debbie Schneider. And Ingla Gusick will be also guest speaking down there. It'll be a great conference, fellowship. There's a flyer. Uh, you can sign up at calvaryoxnard.org. Um, Please pick up a flyer. Now, our first announcement for VBS, Vacation Bible School. Yeah, come on, huh? Listen, I'm putting out the notice now. Not only is it great for our kids, but we need to have you as volunteers. Because, you know, this year's theme is jungle safari, huh? We're gonna transform this place to make a jungle safari, the wilderness experts, we're gonna have bird watchers. Guess who that's gonna be? <laughs> Pastor T, come on. Yeah, and explorers. So please join us, registration, we start it with the kids and then we do need the volunteers, so please do that. And now, uh, would you stand with me as we get ready to just put our hearts, you know, Ephesians 5, 16 reminds us, that we need to redeem the time because the days are evil. And also Psalm 22, 122, 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You know things are happening in the world and we want you to have in your hearts as you're worshiping now to ask God to intervene for the peace and safety of all, especially in that region and here back home. So as we stand, we worship these songs. I ask for the prayer team to come forward. The pastors will be up in front. We have communion for those who want to partake. And listen, this is your time to press in, to meet with God, to ask that his Holy Spirit would just move your heart to understand while well, we have peace and safety here, others are terrified and they're living through the evil days. Let's hold them up in prayer. Amen. Father, we thank you for what's going to happen and, and, and just what you have already planned and the future's already been set. It's in your word. We know it's going to take place. But let us not be faint, Lord, but we give thanks to you. We give thanks for those who are here and those who are watching online that you would just quicken our heart to remember you are in control of all things, but you still ask us to pray. He wants to hear our prayers. So we ask that now. We thank you for the those who give and their tithings, Lord. We ask now that you would anoint the worship team, anoint Pastor Zach as he brings the word. And we ask that you, Lord, would be who we praise today in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, our affection, our devotion.
more time all together. And we will sing now, hallelujah, and we will cry out, hallelujah, and we will sing now, pray together. Father, we sing out hallelujah. We sing out hallelujah in despite of anything that's gone on this week. We sing to remind ourselves of how incredible you are, that you have made the heavens and the earth and that they are in your hands, that you watch us, that you love us, that you care about us, Father. So we pray that in spite of the world's turmoil, Father, that we would turn to songs of praise. We open our hearts to your word this morning, Father, and we ask that you would change us as you do every week. And we are here with expectation that your grace will move once again. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, beloved. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Um, Good morning, church. How's it going? I'm excited to be with you this morning. If we haven't met yet, I'm Zach, one of the teaching pastors here. And um, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled uh, to go through John 17 with you this morning. So if you'll turn to John 17. Um, John 17, as, as Pastor Guzik uh, taught through last week, John 17, we could spend really like years in John 17 and, and only ever scratch the surface of its depth. And there's, there's, there's something rich because we have these glimpses into Jesus teaching us how to pray, yes? Right? He gave us the Lord's Prayer. He showed us how to pray in many different ways. We have declarations about prayer in the epistles. We have Paul talking about what his prayers are for like the church in Ephesus or the church in Philippi. But there's something precious about John 17 because this is an intimate glimpse into Jesus' dialogue with the Father. This is Jesus' prayer. This isn't him teaching us how to pray. This is him praying for us. And, and so there, there's something, there's something um, raw and intimate about it. And, and it's, it is almost like we're peeking into something we're not supposed to, you know? But hallelujah that we get a glimpse into it, yeah? And so uh, the, the first part of John 17, which is often referred to as the high priestly prayer, uh, prayer what Tommy went through, Pastor Tommy went through, is uh, Jesus first prays for himself, right? It's, it's this moment between him and the Father. Last week, Pastor Guzik took us through Jesus' prayers for the disciples, right? The, the 12 that are with him and, and his immediate uh, group that were with him. And now we are going to get a glimpse into Jesus' prayer for us. Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara. So John chapter 17, verse 20 through 26 says this. I do not ask for these only, so these apostles only, these disciples only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, and they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, and they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world." O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, 
that the love of which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. There's a lot of I in him and you and me and me and you and us and we, right? So we'll parse it out together. And Lord Jesus, would you bless your word this morning? Lord, um, you say in John 14, peace I leave you, not peace I give you. Uh, the peace I live you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Lord Jesus, I believe this, this morning, there's many of us who have come in with troubles and worries. And we've made a lot of decisions lately out of worry, a lot of anxiousness. Lord, I pray this morning for peace, not peace as the world gives, but peace and harmony with you, a unity with you, a oneness with you an acknowledgement and a knowledge of you that springs forth into beautiful and wonderful works. Make us whole this morning. Give us peace this morning. Calm whatever frenetic uh, and anxious meanderings of our thoughts and, and Lord, just still our hearts. We love you. We trust that your word does not return void. It never returns void. There's something here for us. And so Lord, would you bless your word? Would you bless the hearing of it? And whatever is said of me may be forgotten, but whatever is said of you may be etched upon our hearts for all of eternity, Lord. We love you, we love you, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for us. And, and, and it's not in the sense that very often in the Bible we insert ourselves into it, yes? Sometimes where we shouldn't. You know what I mean? Like how in, you know, uh, it, it talks about in Leviticus when you raid this one village, make sure that you skin people's heads or you shave people's heads first before you take them as your wife, right? We don't apply that to us, yeah? Cool. That's for a different time, for a different space, yes? We, we tend to insert ourselves into different portions of Scripture, right? We, we tend to say, okay, this is for us, right? This, I, I, and, and, you know, pastors to say, I believe that this is a word for us. And there's this very general sense in which we take the word of God and we say, this applies to us. This applies to us for sure, 100% in this moment. This applies to our hearts. It applies to my marriage. It applies to my life. It applies to my kids. But this is a very specific moment in which Jesus is specifically praying for us believers who would come out of the wake of what the disciples are going to do just months after this. He's praying for us. He's praying for you. He's praying for Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara. He's praying for believers who have given their lives to Jesus in the wake of what the disciples preached 2,000 years ago. We are but one ripple in this mighty wave of God's work. And, and, and we are caught up in something more glorious and more beautiful than we could possibly imagine. And Jesus understands that his disciples, they're going to go through a lot of failure. Yeah, they're going to go through a lot of failure. But ultimately, their work that they're going to do through the Holy Spirit is going to change lives. And it's going to affect even us here today. And there's something beautiful about it. This prayer is an intimate glimpse into the earnest desire of Jesus for us in this day and this time. There are many things we assume Jesus wants for us. We take scripture and we interpret it for our time and space and context, but these words, his actual words, are for us. So, what is God's desire? What is Jesus' desire for us, for us believers, in the wake of the mighty work that he's going to do through his apostles just uh, days after this? There's three things that we see here in this passage. Now, I'm going to give a caveat to Pastor David. I think it was very wise of him to give this caveat last time. I'm not going to go through everything. I, mean, I can't, unless you want to be here for, what, like six and a half hours, Yeah. Which, I mean, we have burritos now. We can just, like, send them in. <laughs> if you want to be here for six and a half hours, I'm game. But we're not going to go through everything. But here's, here's three things that we see here. One, Jesus wants us to be one. Jesus would desire for us to be one. Two, Jesus wants us to see his glory. And three, Jesus wants 
love to dwell in us. So first, Jesus prays that we would be one. Jesus talks a lot about, in in this passage, God and people being in each other and us and him and him and us and God and him and him and God, right? Like you notice just how kind of like, it's like a Jackson Pollock painting of a word, you know, of a prayer a little bit. There's just this here and that, this and him and him and me and me and her and her and this and this and that. You know, it's like so much. But we see this just condensing it down that the Father, Jesus says that the Father is in the Son. That God the Father and God the Son dwell in this beautiful unity and that the Son is in the Father. We see that in verse 21. But we also see that believers are in the Father and in the Son. We see that in verse 21. And then we see that the Son is in believers everywhere. There's this unity, this oneness, this unification between God the Father, God the Son, and us in the Father and in the Son, and the Father and the Son in us. What Jesus, what we're getting a glimpse into is this this unified and beautiful relationship that Jesus has with the Father. And I think he allowed his disciples to peer into this, this moment because he knew that this type of intimacy that he's enjoying right now with the Father is the same intimacy that is going to be available to us to have with the Father and to us to have with Christ, and for us to have with one another. It says here in John 17, verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. One. You know, many cults um, and corrupt ideologies have risen to prominence by promising unity. Many, many cults, many political parties, many ideologies, they, 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 they promise unity. And, and what they mean by unity is, is, is not necessarily what Jesus means by unity. Because there, there really is this ingrained and deep desire in every single one of us to be unified to someone or something or something greater than ourselves. It is ingrained in our nature to be a part of something that is greater than us, to be unified. People uh, fall for it hook, line, and sinker because it's our nature to desire connection and shared vision. It is our nature. It's in our nature to desire these things. It's ingrained in our DNA to want to belong to other people. To feel like we're not just like floating through space aimlessly, but that we have a purpose and we have a place where we can call home and we have a people that we can feel unified, connected to, and tethered to. This is a desire for all of us, but there's many corrupt and wicked ideologies that play to your desire to do that and rope you into something that isn't good for your heart isn't good for your soul, or or is fine, but is keeping you from something greater. The desire is good and God-given. The desire to be whole, the desire to be one with other people, and the desire to be one with God. It says in Genesis 2, the Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. And so we found a helper that was suitable for for Adam. He, He unified him with Eve. And Psalm 133, David says, Behold, how good and pleasant is it when brothers dwell in unity. <clears throat> There's something beautiful in it. There's something beautiful in being unified with other people. And it's our God-given desire within us. It's a God-given and ingrained DNA, deeply embedded need to be one. Jesus desired for every one of us to experience oneness, not just with him, but with each other but not in the way we always think. I think sometimes we mistake unity for uniformity. We, we, we think that unity somehow means that we all need to be uniform, we all need to be same, we need to be on the same page about every single thing, we need to wear the same clothes, we need to sing the same songs, right? We need to clap to the same beat. And, and, and I think sometimes in an attempt for unity, in this earnest yearning for unity, we end up breaking people's spirits and what makes them special. Because we're breaking their legs to kind of form them into, into a mold that they just don't fit. 
And church, if we're not careful as a church, we could do this. We could say, okay, here's like the perfect Christian. Here's the ideal Calvary Chapel goer, right? Like here he is, right? Um, uh, David Newton, uh, I remember we were, uh, we were having coffee and you talked about like Mr. Calvary, right? You know, he's got his Hawaiian shirt. He's got his Bible on his buckle, right? It's like, all right, this is the guy, right? And, and, and it's like sometimes we can have this like image, right, of like what we're supposed to be like, how we're supposed to fit, and think that it, and we mistake it for unity. But really, there's beauty and unity in diversity. We see this in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, living in perfect unity with one another, yet diverse in their attributes and how they function in the world. There's beauty and diversity. We as believers are supposed to have unified diversity. Kind of where you get the word, ironically, university. There is, there is unified diversity that is meant for the body, but there, it, it's, it's not easily won. Unity is not easily won. It is not easily gained. God, Jesus wanted us to be one just as Jesus and the Father are one. And the oneness of the Father and the Son is cosmic and it's eternal. And so it's pretty intimidating for me to think about, like, I'm supposed to be one with you guys? In the same way that Jesus is one with the Father? I'm not sure, right? I basically, I'm not sure because I don't think I'm capable, right? I have a hard enough time relating to my wife and my kids, I'm supposed to relate to every single one of you the same way that Jesus relates to the Father? I can't. I can't do that, right? It's an intimidating thought. It's an intimidating thought, but, but, but here's, in essence, we have to put this in the right context. We have to put this verse in the right context. We have to put this prayer in the right context. Jesus is going to be arrested tonight. This night that Jesus is praying, I don't know whether it was like, 25 minutes after this, I don't know whether it was an hour and 25 after this, two hours, right? I'm not sure on the exact timeline. Smarter people than I have done that research. Sorry. But we do know that Jesus, in just a few moments, in a few hours, is going to get arrested. And he's going to take his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's going to kneel in this quiet moment with the Father pours dripping blood out of anxiousness and reeling that he is about to take on the wrath that was deserved for all of humanity. And Jesus, kneeling before the Father, prays this. And he withdrew from, with them from a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Talk about intimate prayers that we get to glimpse into. This is Jesus saying, God, Father, if there's another way, I don't want to do this. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That is Jesus' unity with the Father. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Unity requires submission. Unity, oneness, requires mutual submission. Beautiful submission. It says this in Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, th uh, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, the oneness 
The unity that Jesus experienced with the Father was expressed in this submission that he didn't count equality with God as this thing to be like touted and flaunted around, but he said, not my will, but yours be done. And he is praying for us that we would be able to experience a similar unity where through mutual submission, we are laying down our lives and our conveniences for each other. We are submitting our comforts and our, even sometimes our dreams for the future so that all of us would be able to thrive in some way. Submitting to something greater than ourselves. Great fruit comes from submitting to something greater than ourselves. Not striving for equality, but serving others in the kingdom. Not saying oneness isn't, hey, I deserve everything that you deserve. Hey, if you're treated this way, then that means I get treated this way. That's how children act. My sons need everything equal. Uh, we went to uh, that place downtown, that new cookie place downtown. I don't know if you've been there, Cookie Plug. It's really good. It's downtown. It's just like these glorious, like soft-baked cookies, humongous. They're like 20 bucks each, right? It's just like, geez, Louise. But my, my boys, they need them, ex- like it needs to be cut exactly equal, Right? That is childlike unity. Childlike unity is saying, hey, 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 he got more than me. We gotta be, we gotta be unified, we gotta be equal here. Where real unity is when dad forgets that he didn't get enough cookies for everyone. Oh, I don't get one today, and that's fine. That's real unity. That's the type of unity that Jesus and the Father had and that Jesus would desire for us. The joy of knowing others get the cookies. Here's the thing. This is true in any relationship. It's true in the meta sense, right, of us as believers, but it's true in an intimate sense. It's true in marriage, right? I'm about to open up a can of worms for you. You ready? You guys are thinking this is going to go one way, and then it's going to go another way. So just please, like, buckle up on the roller coaster with me. Ephesians 5, 22. You guys know this verse. Wives. (laughs) Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. (laughs) Yeah. My heart beat real fast when I was writing notes. (laughs) See, the way Bibles are organized can be tricky. You guys know how there's paragraph breaks in your Bibles? Verses? You guys know the writers of the Bible didn't write it that way? There's no verses. There's no, like, little headings and subheadings. You guys know that, right? It's all one letter. It's not broken up into categories. So, right before... Ephesians 5, 22. Let's go to Ephesians 5, 20 through 21. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Right before Paul says, why submit to your husbands, what does he say? We all submit to each other. We all submit to one another. All of us. We are all called to submit to one another. All of us are called to submit to something greater than ourselves, someone greater than ourselves. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting one another out of reverence to Christ. This reverence, this beautiful like unity that we have with Christ is expressed in the way that we are submitting to and serving one another. Yielding to each other, having this loving give and take with one another. This is how unity is formed. Romans 12, 9 through 10 says this, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another. And showing honor. I love that. Healthy, beautiful competition that I'm going to love you better than you can love me. I'm going to serve you more than you could serve me. This beautiful, wonderful race to just bless each other. 
unity gets muddied up when we're more concerned about equal power than outdoing one another in love. When we're so concerned about equal authority and equal power, it becomes a struggle for who's on top instead of a struggle to figure out who could be propped up more by one another, for one another. This beautiful unity. Jesus declared that this unity, shown through mutual submission, honor, and love, is how the world would see him in us. John 17, verse 23, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. John 13, 35, Jesus says this, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, that, if you, uh, that you have love for one another. Jesus is laying out a pretty compelling case that the way the world is going to know that we are in him is how we treat each other. How are we doing? And not, not just like in this room on a Sunday morning, how are we doing? How are we doing like Monday through Friday? How are we doing to like other denominations? How are we doing to other churches in the community? How are we doing to like believers who disagree with us on like really minor things? How are we doing? Because the way we are unified in mutual submission and love for each other is the testimony that we have to offer the world about who Jesus is. That's hard. I would much rather the testimony to the world just be simply what I have to say about Jesus. But it's not that simple. Because we could preach love all we want. And we can like drop charity bombs into like these different areas, right? These different countries that we never visit again. But on the day to day, how are we treating each other? How are we showing up for each other? That's big. That's huge. That's huge. And here's what unity isn't. We talked about this a little bit. Unity is not uniformity. It's not sameness. God isn't looking for people who look the same, talk the same, wear the same clothes. He isn't looking for mindless adherence to rules to make you look and talk like everybody else. The church is described as a body with different members, unique abilities and traits and quirks and idiosyncrasies submitting to Christ. You could be you. Just be you who loves Jesus and is submitted to Jesus, yeah? Don't be the selfish you. Be the submitting you. But still be you. Don't have to look and talk like anybody else that you think is an approved or like pre-approved like church plus member, right? <laughs> and here's also what unity isn't. Unity isn't easy. And it's not without conflict. Peter described the church as living stones built up in the image of Christ. I don't know if you guys know that stones back then, it's not like they were all like perfectly formed, like uniformed, factory-made, you know, bricks here. Stones required friction and rubbing up against each other and chiseling to make them fit together. And the same is with us. Unity requires some tension. It requires some sanding down and shaving down of our ego so that we could properly fit together and be built up into something that glorifies Jesus. Paul said in Ephesians 4, endeavoring to keep the unity in the spirit and the bond of peace, there is only one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all, hallelujah. There's an endeavoring, though, this is endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. There's a work involved. There's work involved. Unity is hard work and it doesn't come easy. It requires death to self and living in submission to someone more significant than you, Jesus Christ. Um, I remember uh, writing my wedding vows to my, my wife, which is a slippery slope, by the way. Because, you know, like there's cookie cutter vows that you can do. And, and I've, I've done weddings where like they've desired those. And I think that's wise in a lot of ways. Um, because writing your own vows is gnarly. It's gnarly, guys. 
And because, so when I, when I do weddings, I, and, and when a couple wants to write their own vows, I, I'm very forward with them. I say, don't, don't do that cute thing where you say, well, I promise to like, give you foot massages every night. I promise to make you lattes every morning, right? Because first of all, keep this in mind, you're vowing before God to this person. Don't make a vow that you aren't serious about keeping. Be very careful. Be very earnest. Like, be very careful because you're not going to make her a latte every morning. You're just not. Sorry, you're not. I remember writing my vows to my wife and, like, going through all these things I desired for her and realizing, like, I can't do that. Like going through like the checklist of like all the things that she deserves. I'm like, "Mm mm-mm, not me. Also not me. Sometimes me, most of the time, not me. Never me. Mostly me, but I'm going to have moments. I just remember like going through it all and just being like, I can't offer this woman anything. And so I remember being before her on our wedding day and my vows to her, paraphrased, were, I'm not the man of your dreams. I'm not. And I never will be. I'm not going to measure up. I'm going to fail. I'm going to stumble. I can't, I can't give you the love that you need to thrive. So here's what I'll promise. I'll promise that Jesus can do all that for you. I promise that he can. I can And so to the best of my ability, I'm going to show you him. Unity must start with this humble submission to God, first of all, that we can't measure up. We can't give people what they truly need. But perhaps, just perhaps, through strength and willingness to yield, we can offer other people Jesus. And as we face plant through marriage and friendship and parenthood and, and all of these commitments, perhaps, maybe, maybe, these stumbling people, as, G, as, as Tommy calls this misfit pack of weasels, can somehow get it together enough to point each other to Jesus. Unity. Unity. The second thing... And I'm not going to go as long in the other two points as I did the first. The second thing Jesus desires is that we would see his glory. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Simply put, guys, Jesus' desire is that he wants you to see his glory. He wants you to see him. He wants you to see glory. He wants you to experience glory in eternity. Yes, amen, but also here and now. The kingdom of God and the glory of Jesus is going to be available for us into eternity. Hallelujah. But there are glimpses and pockets of it here and now that we get to experience. Paul prays this in Ephesians 3. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be Filled with all the fullness of God. That's Paul's desire for us as well. That we would know the height, the breadth, the depth of God's love for us. That we would understand the magnitude of Jesus' glory. This is an earnest desire Jesus has for us. That we would know his glory. That we would know it. But Paul says, he says here, that that we don't need, it doesn't take education to comprehend the love and the glory of God. It doesn't take profound wisdom and insight to comprehend the majesty and the glory of God. It says, he says, I pray that you would have the strength to know it. 
I pray that you would have the strength to know it, not, not the intellectual prowess, not the education to comprehend it. I pray that you would have the strength to comprehend Jesus' glory. Now, why does he say strength? All throughout Scripture, when people behold the glory of God, it's too much for them. It's too much. They ask for less. They shy away. They cover their eyes. They bow their faces. It's too much for them. It's too much. His majesty is too gnarly, too palpable, too hot to handle. There is a humble fortitude to stand before God and remain. His glory is too great for us to handle. When Peter first encountered Jesus, like really encountered Jesus, he was aimless, he was ineffectual as a fisherman, he was purposeless and hopeless. And Jesus is like, hey, want to go fishing? He's like, dude, I fished all night. I smell like fish. I need to take a bath before I go home to my wife and tell her once again, I failed. And Jesus is like, let's go, come on. And Peter says the same thing that Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Let's go. And the entire boat is cracking under the pressure and the weight of all the fish that Jesus had him catch. And when Peter got to behold just that sliver, it's just fish, but Peter got to behold just a sliver of Jesus' glory, it says he bowed and he says, get away from me. Get away from me, Lord. Get away. I'm a sinful man. The prophets of old, when they would behold Jesus, like, no, no, who am I? I'm a man of unclean, like, what, what am I going to do? Peter, just get away from me, God. Those moments, Jesus wants us to experience these moments where we see his glory, and we're floored by it, and we're humbled by it, and we realize, I don't measure up at all before the God of all creation. I don't measure up even a little bit. I'm ashamed. I can't be in your presence. And what Jesus' desire for us is to understand those moments of palpable glory and then to experience his embrace. Because Peter experienced his glory and it's like, get away from me, God. And then Jesus said, follow me. Follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Follow me and I'll make you great, Peter. I'll make you great. Jesus' desire for us is that we would see his glory and it would spur us into something greater than ourselves. Greater than ourselves. And then the last thing we see here is that love would dwell in us. It says right here, 25 and 26, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these that you have sent me, I may know to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Before Jesus came onto the scene, John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River, right? He was calling, like, thousands of people flocked to John the Baptist. Thousands. Guys, like, John the Baptist had a following. It was gnarly. And John the Baptist, his message was simple. Repent. Like, come forth. Like, we've fallen short. Like, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is coming. You better be ready for it. And thousands and thousands of people resonated with that message, as weird as John was, because John was a weirdo. Like, if, if John the Baptist were here today, none of you would listen to him. John the Baptist, though, he had this message. Repent. It's coming. Prepare the way of the Lord. It's coming. Something glorious is coming. Be ready for it. And people were being baptized because they were turning back to God. They weren't quite sure what it all meant. They weren't quite sure the full picture. But they realized that they had strayed and they needed to give their lives back to the Lord. 
We're going to be doing baptisms, and some of you might feel something similar to these people back then in the Jordan River listening to John the Baptist. As John the Baptist preached, they could feel that tightness in their chests, that angst, that understanding, that sometimes subtle or overwhelming sense of hopelessness. That feeling that they weren't enough, they didn't measure up, they couldn't please God, but they knew they had to take a step somewhere. And some of you might be feeling this way. The tightness in your chest, that labored breath, as you think about God. You're like, I, I just don't know if I'm good enough. How could God be pleased with me? But these people, they stepped into the water nonetheless because they knew something glorious was going to happen. And then in the midst of it all, the sea of people that are standing on the shore, there's this figure that weaves in and out. Nobody notices him. Nobody recognizes him. Except for John. And this man who is just a normal face among all the faces, emerges. And you hear the booming voice of the voice crying out in the wilderness, John the Baptist saying, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus goes into the water and allows John, although he's sinless, he allows John to baptize him. And when Jesus emerges out of the water, it says that the heavens cracked open says this in Mark 10, 1, verse 10. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. Torn. Like, like the skies were cut with a blade. And the heavens were torn open. And the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Jesus has the pleasure of the Father. Jesus has the favor of the Father. Jesus has the love of the Father. It's in him that God is pleased. And this beautiful and glorious work that Jesus is praying for us is that we would realize that that same favor, that same love, and that same pleasure that God has in Jesus, he now has in you. Because when Jesus hung on that cross, everything that was true of you, your sinfulness, your brokenness, your inability to measure up, everything that was true about you, that night on Golgotha became true about Jesus. And then when he rose again, everything that was true about Jesus is now true about you. You have the pleasure and the favor and the love of God. In the same way, the heavens cracked open and the skies poured forth with a voice saying, this one, yes, this is the one. That's how God feels about you. Yes, mine, I'm pleased with you. I'm pleased with you. And so Jesus' final prayer for us, it's Christ's earnest prayer for you and for I that we would experience the love and the favor of God to gaze up into heaven and hear the gentle voice of a father that says, I'm pleased with you. I'm pleased with you. Feel it. Understand it. Know it. And then live it out. Stop living as people who don't have the favor of God with them. Stop living as people who are on the outcasts and are on the fringes of God's beloved community. You are a part of this whole thing. And God looks upon you. If you have given your faith in Jesus Christ, God looks upon you and says, this one, yes. It is in him, it is in her, I am well pleased. Not because of your own righteousness or anything you've done, but because the blood of Jesus has covered you. The favor of God is upon you. Will you stand with me? Live in submission to God, unified in community, and driven by love. That is my prayer for us this morning as we close. And if you have yet to fully experience that favor from God, like, I, I don't know if God's pleased with me. I don't know if God loves me. I don't know. 
the prayer team will be up here ready to pray with you, to walk you through what it means to be accepted into the glory and the favor of Jesus. So, this morning, you might be tempted to like leave for the last song. Don't. I usually sit in the back. I see you. <laughs> what we do here with worship is with one voice, one mind, one heart, declaring the glory of God. If we can't sing together, how are we going to live together? If we can't just sing a song together declaring the glory of God, how on earth are we going to go into our community where it's actually hard? One voice, one anthem, one body, unified people giving praises to their God. Lord Jesus, receive our praise this morning. Receive the glory that is due to you. Change us and mold us and shape us into your image so that we might be effective in each other's lives, but also for this world, that they would know you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship.
week.